Joining me now to discuss is co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign and the president of Repairs of the Breach, Bishop William Barber, who says we need a resurrection, not an insurrection. Thank you, Bishop, for joining me. What do you mean by that, sir? Well, what I mean is in this moment, we cannot keep declaring that the democracy is in peril. We cannot keep talking about the immoral reality that something is terribly wrong and then not engage in the kind of moral challenge and nonviolent direct action. So the Poor People's Campaign and our over 40 state coordinating committees and partners along with about 20 other organizations are going to come together and announce that we're calling for a season of nonviolent moral direct action to demand the end to the filibuster, to demand the full passage of what I call the John Lewis bill, the John Lewis for the People Act, because that's what he worked on, the Voting Rights Act, and a $15 living minimum wage because of how the denial of those things is hurting so many people. And we're calling for it to come together we're going to start on July the 12th with a massive, massive nationwide call in to every senator on the 19th, the anniversary of Seneca Falls, with a nonviolent moral direct action in D.C. led by women from all over the country. July 26th in every Senate office, regardless of party, in at least 45 states. And then on August the 2nd, a mass number of clergy and low wage and poor workers are going to join together, putting the pulpit and the street together for a massive nonviolent moral direct action. We must change this narrative. And when we see these extremists continuing, we cannot stand down. Mm -hmm. We've got to build a movement now. We gotta do it while people are in DC and in their offices. And Charles, we're gonna have to have mass, I believe moral civil disobedience um, nonviolently. We're gonna have to have mass voter registration and education. We're gonna have to have more litigation and we're going to have to have meaningful legislation and we cannot stand down. So this is not the moment to go home and stand down and lay down. Instead of an insurrection, right. we need a moral resurrection. <laughs> Bishop Barber, what, the things that you are enumerating there sound like the opposition being mobilized to put pressure on elected officials. Is there any part of your plan that, would, that seeks to convert the people who are still in Trump's camp, who are still devotees and acolytes. Is, is conversion any part of this plan or is, or is that part, you know, uh, off the table or for the moment and is all of the action about putting pressure on elected officials? Well, actually, we see the action as three dimensional. First, the action changes the narrative and moves this from just being, for instance, the voting issue from just being black versus white to an issue of the democracy versus autocracy. And to show how when you attack black people's voting right, you actually are hurting everybody and undermining the ability to pass the kind of policies that lift people out of poverty and low wages. The second dimension is by changing the narrative and talking about it from but, a moral perspective. What, is that, what you, if that's the plan? What, what if that's the plan that? though? I mean, I, I think, I, it, it, you know, what if, what if, have, uh, you know, creating a system that where it is, you are unable to lift people out of poverty is part of the mm -hmm. plan. You know, I, I, oh, it is you know, I, I don't plan. give yeah. them the, the benefit of the doubt to say that they, this is right. just a unwelcome side effect. It feels like, you know, as the, the saying goes, cruelty is the point. Well, it is the point. You're exactly right. And we have to connect for people to understand that voting, the suppression of voting rights is a form of, of, of a way in which people, um, you know, stop wages and stop wealth. I call it the transfer of wealth to the wealthy. But in that process, if you expose that, then you can have conversion of people who've not traditionally worked with. You know, that's what we do in the Poor People's Campaign. We organize people that have not traditionally been united together. And so, and then the second thing that this does, it, the third thing is it does put pressure on the people who are in office. So we see it as three dimensional and creating a moral, nonviolent, direct action where people are willing to say, we're gonna engage in this action. And if you choose to arrest us, we're willing to wear that as a badge and nonviolent civil disobedience, 
because we're willing to put our bodies there to change the whole narrative and conversation. And we're going to do it in a fusion way. It's going to be black and white and brown and, and Asian and native and gay and straight and young and old. That's what the politicians haven't seen in, in seriously. That's what people haven't seen. That's the way we can break through to the minds of the people. Look, everything we're talking about today, Charles, it took this to win it. It took it to win it. It should not surprise us that it's going to take it to hold on to it, to fight these extremists, and to expand, which is why, as you heard me note, we're talking about we're connecting the economics and the voting because we want to drive this narrative to help bring people in, change minds, change the narrative, and put pressure on uh, elected officials. And lastly, you heard me list five straight Mondays. And additionally, things are going to be going on through the week, but those five straight National Mall Mondays is designed to be a season. We can't just do one rally anymore or one effort. We've got to do it for a season and stay at it and be committed. So speaking of that season, how realistically, how much time do you think you have to put pressure on people to get legislation moved, passed yeah. and signed? Well, you know, it's interesting. The climate movement, they say we got nine years before there's irreparable damage. I don't think we have, we don't have that long. We don't have, I think August the 6th is the 56th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. The damnable reality, the immoral reality is we have less voting rights today than we had August 6, 1965. We are saying August 6th ought to be the deadline to have the For the People Act passed, voting vote vra restored living wages past 15 and the end this filibuster so that we can move forward other legislation and if that happens by august 6th it's a victory if it doesn't happen then we in the movement are clear we got to be very clear about what we need to do from august all the way through the midterm because we've got to do some major major fundamental changes because what we have as one writer described it this week we are moving closer and closer to, we already have almost a, a, a civil oligarchy. We're headed toward mm -hmm. autocracy, and we better fight to hold on to this possibility of the democracy that we have. We, we're not we're not even at a full democracy. Mm -hmm. We got a problem, but at least it has possibility. And so we're saying August right. 6th is the anniversary of the signing of the Voting Rights Act. Everything we're talking about should be, could be, and can be done by them, and we're then, and we're willing to put the pressure on to see it happen. Bishop Barber, always a pleasure, sir. Thank you for joining me tonight. Thank you. Take care now. God bless.